Welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Heather Long, an economics correspondent at The Post. And we're going to spend the next half an hour trying to unpack this complicated economic recovery we are currently in. And we'll be talking about both the economy and higher education. I'm thrilled to be joined today to unpack what's going on with Philadelphia Federal Reserve President Patrick Harker. Welcome, Pat, to Post Live. Uh, Heather, it's great to be with you. Good to see you again. You too. So let's start with, I want to hear what is on your mind the most. What are you being emailed about, called about? You're constantly talking to people in the Philadelphia yeah. area. It's it's really confusing time right now. There's headlines of inflation and labor shortage and supply constraints. Yep. What's at the top of your radar? There are the two, inflation and the labor market, uh, the shortage of labor. I think it's worth, though, going back before the pandemic hit as we were, re we were recovering from the Great Recession. We had similar labor problems, but I want to come back to that. But first on inflation, that issue uh, is clearly top of mind to people. It's top of mind to me in terms of where this is all going. Um, so we can talk about that as well. But there are the two issues, labor and inflation. So let me ask you point blank. Do we have a labor shortage in the United States right now? Again, I think if you go back before the pandemic and think about, that's hard for people to think about, right? That how tight labor markets were and inflation was under our 2% target. So in that world, we had a labor shortage, particularly for skilled labor, particularly in areas like manufacturing, but also in construction and you name it. So those didn't go away because of the pandemic. Was, if anything, they're exacerbated by the pandemic. So yes, we do have a labor shortage. And there's a couple of likely suspects for why that happened, right? One is uh, people have, uh, they're reluctant to go back to work because of the pandemic. Also, particularly women, and we've seen women drop out of the labor force in larger numbers than men, uh, particularly for lower income jobs. The access to childcare or the fact that their children aren't in school full time. Those things are very real and they've impacted uh, people's ability to get back to work. And there is the question of how much the unemployment insurance has first helped people that really needed it, and in some cases maybe delayed their return to the workplace. In my mind, those are all, they're important factors. Those factors though are temporary. That is, they will resolve themselves over the next couple of months. You think about schools reopening, childcare reopening, uh, unemployment benefits are going to run off, uh, the you know, extraordinary uh, support we've given to the American public, that's gonna run off. And so those will start to correct themselves over time. Yeah. You did bring up the unemployment benefit. Obviously, that's become a big debate right now, that extra $300 people are getting from the federal government on top of about 300 on average most people would get mm -hmm. if there weren't the pandemic bump. Uh, do you think that extra money is preventing some people from wanting to go back to work? Do you think maybe it's time to end that early? So I think this really varies a lot by location and by industry. I mean, I think this is not a one size fits all at all. I mean, I think the, the issue here, it may be affecting some people, but it's not the only thing affecting people. Again, people know that the longer they're work out of the workforce, the harder it is to get back into the workforce. So people intuitively know that, that they need to get back into the game. But there are these things holding them back, child care, elder care, a whole host of other issues. And one of the issues in an urban environment like Philadelphia is transit. People are not only concerned about the workplace environment they're going to return to, but also getting to and from that environment on mass transit. All those as we get the vaccine more and more into people's arms, which we really need to do, these will resolve themselves. I mean, but we have to be attentive to it, but they're going to run off. I mean, the, the unemployment benefits will run off here over the next couple of months. So I'm less worried about that right now and more worried about doing everything we can to give people the sense that it is safe to return to work. Got it. Um, I want to ask you, obviously, you're a Fed official and these debates are going on. Um, you know, a lot of people were a little surprised when the minutes came out from the April meeting you all were at 
and there's this line in there about if the economy continues its rapid pace of, of progress that I think the wording was it might be appropriate at an upcoming meeting to discuss lowering the bond purchases you all have been doing, yeah. so something that Wall Street calls tapering. Uh, can you say a little bit more specifically about what you would want to see before you would feel comfortable having that discussion about reducing the Federal Reserve's bond buying? Sure. Um, it is something that, in my mind, we should start to have a conversation about sooner rather than later. I think it is important for us and I think it's important for the audience to recognize that we're, in my view, we need to follow the playbook we had after the Great Recession. That is to start to taper the bond purchases, to slowly remove accommodation carefully, methodically, I would even argue boringly, so that we don't surprise the market, we don't surprise anyone. We take our time to do this, to unwind those purchases. And then at the appropriate time, if the economy continues to heal like we forecast, then to think about raising the Fed funds rate. But it really is the first step is to slowly taper these bond purchases. So what I'm looking for in terms of when we start that process is continued strength in the labor markets, that is getting people back to work, that we're seeing the 8 million plus people who need to get back to work. And really it's more like 11 million. Because if you factor in the fact that we were producing 200,000 jobs a month, roughly, you add that in, we really need about 11 million jobs to, for people to come back. So continued progress there, which we're making. Ed, we want to see with our new, and we'll talk about this, inflation, we want to see inflation move above our 2% target, but not in a major way, just rising above 2% and averaging 2% over time. So keeping inflation expectations anchored, and having inflation rise above 2% for a period of time under control, if I see those things starting to happen, then yeah, I think it's, uh, it's appropriate that we start the tapering discussion. Got it. And I guess, are you pretty optimistic that that could happen in the coming months, that, that you are seeing a pretty rapid recovery in your area? Yeah, I think we are starting to see service industries come back alive. Um, I was just down at the Jersey Shore last weekend um, and just talking to the woman in the gro local grocery store. She was the manager. So I, you know, I, this is how I also get information. There's lots of data, there's a, but you just talk to people. And she said she's having a heck of a time finding anybody to work this summer. And so, you know, we, we clearly have these jobs. We need to get people back in those jobs, again, so they feel safe. Uh, the, I think we are starting to see the reopening of the economy. Look, we we did something unprecedented as an American society. We basically shut down big parts of the economy to help keep all of us safe in terms of uh, the health of the American people. This is something that's going to take some time, right? The fact that we shut everything down, bringing it back online is going to take some time. And there are going to be bumps along the way. People used to ask, we don't ask this anymore, right? what letter I thought the recovery was going to be. And I always said it was going to be a, right? I always said it was going to be a, a bumpy Nike swoosh. That is, it was going to take time. It wasn't going to be a straight line up, but it was going to be wavy. We weren't going to just get a straight line here. So yeah, I'm pretty optimistic. And that's what I'm hearing. And manufacturing, uh, we continue to hear from manufacturers, our latest manufacturing business outlook survey, lots of optimism, not as much as last month, but still lots of optimism. So manufacturers are optimistic. I think as we get people back into their lives, particularly with schools opening, that's a big part of the American society, that the kids are safe, the kids are back into something that resembles normal. As we start to move toward that, I'm, I'm quite optimistic. Yeah. Can I ask you about housing? One of the questions I get a lot from Washington Post readers, and I'm sure you do too, uh, yeah. is they're looking at these prices that are up a lot. You know, from a year ago, many markets 10% higher, and they're kind of scratching their heads. Why is the Federal Reserve still buying those mortgage-backed securities to support the real estate market You know, when things look so good? So I'm curious, you're, how do you respond to people? Like, do you have concerns overall about home prices going up right now? And 
you know, why the Fed needs to keep supporting real estate. So do I have concerns? Yes, particularly for low income and moderate income uh, individuals and families. I mean, they are being shut out of these communities right now. And that's a real concern because where do they go? So that's one that's outside monetary policy per se, but it is something that we need to make sure that we take care of. One of the areas we've been doing a lot of research on in the Philly Fed is on foreclosure. There's a, a really important paper that came out in the Philly Fed a while ago on foreclosures, really understanding first what the forbearance uh, statistics really are. They're hard to gather right now because a lot of the data is hard to read, things like credit reports, because yeah. of the stimulus and the support we've given. But our researchers, I think, did a quite, quite a good job of trying to understand that and also come up with possible ways to avoid foreclosure out of that forbearance that would, over time, benefit the family, but also benefit the banks. Because, you know, we don't want to relive the situation we had in the Great Recession where we had a lot of homes sitting empty. That's not good for the banks, it's not good for the communities, and it's clearly not good for those families. So I think there's work we can do here to help keep people in their homes. When it comes to monetary policy, again, I am of the camp that sooner rather than later, we should start talking about tapering. And clearly part of that conversation will be the MBS tapering. Got it. And I, let me compliment the Philly Fed. We used your data at the Washington Post on uh, foreclosures and, and stress in the housing market last year. It was some of the mm -hmm. best that I saw. So thank you for that. Um, I've got a bunch of higher education questions, but let me throw one more your way because you've been one of the more outspoken Fed members about cryptocurrency and digital currency over the years. And I remember talking to you two years ago and you, you predicted that yeah. one day the Fed would probably do a digital currency. Um, I'm curious to get your take. A lot of people, a lot of discussion about these big plunges in the crypto market in the last few days. Does this signal anything to you? Do you what what do you make of what's going on? So yeah, I remember that conversation a couple of years ago. Uh, and basically what I said is sooner or later, I didn't say sooner, but at some point uh, we will move away from coin and, and paper. Uh, to a more digital form of currency. I didn't say when, and I still don't know when that's going to be. That's a conversation we have to have. And we are, as you heard yesterday from Chair Powell, we are thinking about this and, and how we do this. And, but there are implications of this. And uh, our research is facility fed of doing a lot of work on what are the pros and cons of doing this with respect to market structure, the structure of the financial system, it's really important that before we make any move in this direction, and of course, our colleagues in the Boston Fed have been piloting what might look like technology that would support this. But I think the issue of market structure and who are the winners and losers in this, are, it's really important to understand that ahead of time. And that's the kind of work our economists are doing. So yeah, I think, but it's not, it's not crypto per se. It's some form of currency. Right, it's not paper and coin. It doesn't have to be uh, what the existing models of cryptocurrency. There are other models out there, and there are other ways of doing it. Uh, a rival uh, publication last month had a you know cover story on GovCoin, uh, as they called it. Uh, there are various ways of doing that too. I mean, they they discuss one, which is Americans all having an account at the Fed. There are other ways of doing that, working through existing banks. So I think there's a lot of work we need to do, a lot of discussion we need to have before we're ready and to really think about implementing such a system. Got it, from the Fed. And can I just follow up and ask, when you see these big declines in the crypto market that get a lot of headlines in, in the recent days, I mean, I know you all try not to comment on asset prices generally, but does it mean anything to you? Do you think it's big enough that this is some sort of signal about sentiment or inflation or how people are feeling? So I don't think in terms of financial stability, the stability of the financial system, it's not large enough at this point uh, to have an outsized concern. It's something you're obviously, I'm obviously watching, but I don't have an outsized concern on the risk associated with that. Um, it's a very volatile, uh, I wouldn't call it even a currency, commodity. Uh, and I think it's 
part of the evolution that we're going through. It's part of the innovation uh, that happens with any new technologies. So I think it's worth watching. And it's actually really important that we watch this and try to learn from what's going on in the market. But I don't have an outside concern with, with respect to the overall risk to the economy. Got it. So most of us know you today in your role as an economic policymaker, but obviously most of your background was in higher education. You were president yep. of the University of Delaware and dean at the Wharton School and many other positions along the way in higher ed. So you, you all just had a big conference at the Philly Fed, and you called it this, the peril that higher education is going through. Yep. So I'm wondering, just big picture, are we on the verge of a mass of wave of closures of higher education institutions. Are you really worried about that? So let me put a little context uh, for the people who are listening in. So there are roughly 4,000 institutions of higher education in America with roughly 4 million employees and 20 million students. So it is a substantial industry, if you think of it as an industry. In addition to what it does in terms of training the next generation of not only workers, but citizens in this country. And we know this is really important. Uh, these degrees matter. And somebody who gets a bachelor's degree, either Bachelor of Arts or Bachelor of Science, on average will make almost $3 million a year over the course of their lifetime, more than somebody who didn't. That said, I think there are other pathways other than a traditional four-year degree as well to move people into uh, a middle class life uh, and have a good life. So, uh, yeah, it, it's an issue. And what's happening now is the pandemic accelerated trends we were already seeing in higher education. First, the traditional college age population, right, the 18 year olds, uh, that's in decline. And that's been in decline for quite a while in this country. And with the pandemic hitting and the birth rates uh, that we're seeing, the low birth rates, that there'll be, again, bumps that'll go up and down, but the long-term trend is not very good with respect to that traditional age cohort. That combined with additional costs that higher education institutions incurred has really put them in a tough spot. So some research that we just issued out of the Fed, if you look at over a five-year period, the losses that higher education is going to incur in the country, they're about 70 to $115 billion. And 80% of the institutions in this country will be impacted, particularly the small institutions. So I do think we're already starting to see more merger activity. Uh, one of my old colleagues, a, a university president, said to me, he's getting these calls on a fairly frequent basis of smaller institutions coming to him and saying, would you be interested in a deal, either a merger or acquiring us? So yeah, this is already starting to happen. It was happening before the pandemic, and this has just accelerated. Wow, that is the line I circled when I read your speech <laughs> and the research was in that 80% of all institutions are likely to face a revenue shortfall, higher education institution. I mean, that's just an astounding mm -hmm. number. Um, yeah. So can you talk us through, you, you laid out a call to action. You said that you think there needs to be more government investment in higher education. So what do you mean by that? Obviously, there's a lot of priorities right now that are competing for money. You know, why mm -hmm. are you, in your mind, why is this such a high priority? Well, I think for the long-term health of our economy, we need an educated workforce, right? And high school alone, often doesn't cut it. And so there's a whole host of programs. There's a traditional four-year degree, but there's also associate's degrees. I mean, junior colleges, community colleges do a terrific job, um, but they've been under-resourced. And also non-degree programs, certificate programs, uh, credentialing, all this. It's a mix of things that we need to do to fill out this labor market that we know is tight now. It was tight before the pandemic. And given uh, a combination of, again, decline in the traditional college age population. And um, I would also put in there uh, immigration policy, which is not our, not our business at the Fed, but just in terms of the number of people coming in to fill those jobs, it's really tight in certain industries and in certain sectors. So yeah, I, I do think that um, we, need to, we need to address all of this and public higher education the public institutions have really been cut back quite tremendously 
over the past couple of decades for a very simple reason. When the state gets squeezed, the easy thing for legislators and the governors to do is to cut higher ed and tell higher ed to raise tuition because they can't do that on pre-K through 12 or prisons or roads and so forth. So I know personally, <laughs> you know, I had a situation where uh, I had my one of my budget hearings down in Dover, Delaware, uh, for the University of Delaware, and the co-chair of this powerful committee um, in his office privately said, look, I understand your situation, but we can't give you more money. We've got to cut you because I've got these other priorities. They, well, they don't have tuition. And then I went into a public hearing and he lambasted me for <laughs> increasing tuition. Uh, but that's okay. That's all part of the game. That, that's part of But that's what's been happening. If you look at the support for public higher education, it's been cut back and back and back. And so, yes, private institutions are important, but public higher education is for many, many people the way they enter the first generation cohorts enter the middle class. They're really important to our society. And I'm just worried that we've underinvested in those. And as a result, um, it's harder and harder for people to get in. Because what matters in education isn't just that you get in, it's that the, the institutions have the resources to help you finish, right? You get no economic benefit if you don't finish. And so mm -hmm. the, supports that, the, the supports that are needed to help people get through a degree program are just as important as bringing in a diverse cohort. And again, the other thing I said in this speech, which is really interesting, given the changing demographics of America, colleges, particularly public institutions, are seeing people coming from lower income communities because of the birth rates. It's just simply the demographic. At a time when they've been cut back more and more. And so they're raising prices, tuition, at a time when people can least afford it. That's a problem we need to resolve. Hmm. Are you a supporter of free two-year community college education? We've seen some states, both red and blue, do those initiatives. And now, obviously, mm -hmm. there's a, a call at the national level to, to make you know, two years free community college. Do you think that would be a game changer? It could be. I mean, I can tell you my own personal experience, uh, but it has to be a well-run, high-quality program. And this is, and that, there are many in the country, but not all. And so, mm. again, what, matter, what matters is completion. And for students to complete, they not only have to get the support, but also we know there's tremendous heterogeneity in, you know, college pays off on average as opposed to not going to college. But there are many times where it depends on what you studied and where you studied. And so, in some cases, it would, it's better off going into the trade uh, than uh, some some people who go, but they never finish their degree, uh, or they finish their degree, but it's in an area that really isn't going to pay off. So, yeah, I mean, I think community colleges in, in particular play an incredibly important role in all this as well. But we need to stay focused on bringing people in and getting them either the credential or the degree they need and getting them to finish. Finish is really, really important. I want to ask you, and you probably had this debate with her yourself, um, your colleague at the Fed, Mary Daly, the president of the San Francisco Fed, she mm -hmm. came on Post Live not too long ago, and she's a big proponent of, of the four-year degree, that particularly for lower-income people, they really need to finish the four-year degree, not just the two-year, because she argues you know, the income bump and the career prospects are just so much higher if you do the four-year degree. You know, you've obviously, just in our conversation the last few minutes, you've talked a lot about certificate programs, two-year degrees. Um, do you kind of disagree with her a bit that, that there's too much emphasis on the four-year? So, I agree, on average, Mary is right, right, on average. But averages, as we know, hide a lot. As I said a few minutes ago, there's a lot of heterogeneity. And so you see students who enter programs that then are not prepared for those programs and they don't finish, uh, or uh, they study something which doesn't lead them to the kind of economics. They may, there are other benefits, ancillary benefits for them studying whatever they want to study. But 
it doesn't lead to the economics that they thought they were going to get. I'll give you one example. There was a student I met, uh, actually a woman I met, who was a welder at the shipyard in Philadelphia. She had studied art. She did metal art, so she learned welding. And after a couple of years, she realized, I can't make money doing this. So I can do my art on the side, but I can get a union job with great benefits to be a, a, a welder. So my point is, we're a big country very diverse country. So the idea that one size fits all, I just don't accept. There's some people where an, a college degree, particularly low income people, we need again to focus not just on getting them in, but getting them out uh, with the support they need. And it has to be a high quality program. But in other cases, a two year degree is sufficient. And in some cases, and it doesn't all have to be at once. The other thing we have to break is this view that I'm 18 years old and I'm going to make a decision for the rest of my life, right? I mean, I, look, I spent my whole life in higher ed and 18 year olds are still trying to figure it out. Heck, I'm 62. I'm still trying to figure it out, right? So the idea that an 18 year old is going to figure it all out, there are other pathways, right? So maybe you get an associate's degree, maybe you go work and you get an apprenticeship and the apprenticeship pays for your college degree. They're different ways. We don't all have to do the same thing in exactly the same way. So with Mary, I do agree that getting more and more education is important and retraining in some cases. It, it doesn't end just when you get that degree. There's constant retraining we need in our economy. In some cases, you get that on the job. In other cases, you have to go back to school to get it. So mm. I just think we have to celebrate the diversity here of the American economy and the American people. And give people access to what makes sense for them. What I'm worried about is the lack of access and the lack of success for whatever they choose. Yeah, um, we've got time for one more question. So I wanna throw this one your way. Are you worried about a lost generation of college students because of the pandemic? You know, Philadelphia Fed in your research, you all cited enrollment numbers down 13% over for first years overall in yeah. this academic year. And it's even worse at community colleges, close to 20% down in some cases. I mean, these are jaw dropping mm -hmm. numbers that really signal a lot of low income students did not enroll this year. Do you think, are you optimistic that they'll come back or do you think we might have a lost generation here? Yeah, so it's not only in higher ed. I mean, you can go all the way through the educational system. I mean, students who have been doing online classes for the whole year, particularly low income students who have really struggled because of access to technology and just all the, all the situations they face. So we have a problem up and down in terms of uh, getting students a high quality education. So yeah, I am worried about this. This is one where I, one issue I think we as a society really need to focus on. And if that means we need to extend somebody's education for a year and their opportunities for education for a year, I think we should do it because not only will they benefit, but when they benefit the entire economy. So yeah, I am supportive of that because I, I, I do worry that uh, people had to make choices in the pandemic. They had to drop out of school or never went into school because of financial situations that their families were in. We need to resolve it. I mean, and there are ways of resolving, but we need to collectively come together and say, we need to get these young people and not just young people, not so young people, retrained into the new jobs that this economy is producing. Yes, and access to technology was another big one. Some people just yeah, couldn't absolutely. do those online classes. Um, yeah. Are you all back in person at the Fed? Are you are you going into the office every day? Can you give us an update there? No, nah, I'm sitting here in southern New Jersey, right across from the Fed. So no, we are we'll be easing back in uh, as Philadelphia starts to relax some of its constraints. But we want to abide by the local conditions. All right, and the hardest question I'll end on: Are you Sheets or Wawa? Well, there's actually no sheets right here. Although I like I, I, Joe Sheets, the head of the company, and the head of Wawa are both uh, good friends of mine, and I like both of them. But I also <laughs> there's another there's another competitor that's entered our market with really good fried chicken. I knew well down in Delaware. I won't name them, but they've got really good fried chicken, so I go there quite often. <laughs> All right, <laughs> you might really get beat up for that one. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> anyway, as a fellow Pennsylvanian, I can make these jokes. Thank you so much for joining us, Pat Harker, always insightful. Thanks, Heather. And please join us for more Washington Post Live. We have an amazing lineup on Monday, including Malcolm Gladwell, the well-known author, Amy Klobuchar, Senator from Minnesota, and many Hollywood celebs talking about some of the latest movies coming out soon. Thank you.